A singing wilderness is what naturalist and poet Sigrid F. Olson found when he wandered the Boundary Waters region. Here is a land of rock, water, and forest. A land quiet enough that one can hear the natural world speak. speak to the soul of humankind. Where we feel awake with our entire being. Far more important than the places I have seen, or what I have done, or thought about, is the possibility of hearing the singing wilderness and catching, perhaps, its real meaning. Sigurd F. Olson. Containing four parks, the Boundary Waters region stretches from Isle Royal in Lake Superior on the east, to Voyagers National Park on the west. In between, it contains the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. The largest pristine wilderness in the lower 48 states. It is an area with over 1,000 icy clear blue water lakes. An area of well over a million acres of pristine nature. unchanged since the last ice age. And the Boundary Waters also contains Grand Portage National Monument, an area where French-Canadian voyagers gather to exchange their trade goods. Goods canoed across the Boundary Waters' many lakes and portages from the 1750s until the mid-1800s. Indeed, the voyager's route through the Boundary Waters defines the Canadian-U.S. border. There is no water world, no lake topography, like the Boundary Waters anywhere else on the planet. It is a special place. Wilderness really is a shared imagination. It's a shared uh, concept that we hold in our minds. The land is untrammeled, and untrammeled doesn't mean untrampled. A lot of people misinterpret that. Untrammeled means let free, you know, allowed to be free. And so that's what, that's what the Boundary Waters is. It's a very unique landscape that's allowed to be free and allowed to do what it, what it wants to do. Stephen Wilbers is a modern day writer who understands the soul nurturing quality of the Boundary Waters Lakes. He knows they will transform you soon after you arrive. Maybe not when I take that first stroke of the uh, canoe paddle, but in a few hours I can feel the, the sort of the beauty, but also the reverence that comes from being in a relatively undisturbed wilderness. Um, it's different from just a, a park. We have lovely parks in Minneapolis and all over Minnesota. Every state has beautiful parks. But there's something different about being able to turn 360 degrees and not see a cell phone tower, a building, a road, a utility line, and, and just really getting a sense of what this North American continent was like for hundreds of thousands of years 
as, um, as the first humans sort of work their way into this area. But perhaps no one captured the essence of the Boundary Waters better than Sigurd Olsen. The movement of a canoe is like a reed in the wind. Silence is part of it, and the sounds of the lapping water, bird songs, and wind in the trees. It is part of the medium through which it floats, the sky the water, the shores. There is magic in the feel of a paddle and the movement of a canoe, a magic compounded of distance, adventure, solitude, and peace. The way of a canoe is the way of the wilderness and of a freedom almost forgotten. It is an antidote to insecurity the open door to waterways of ages past, and the way of life with profound and abiding satisfactions. When a man is part of his canoe, he is part of all that canoes have ever known. If Isle Royal is the jewel of the Boundary Waters, if Grand Portage is the history of the Boundary Waters, and if the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness is the soul of the Boundary Waters, then Voyagers National Park is the spirit of the Boundary Waters. What does Voyagers National Park mean to me? It's a place to get away and really step away from the busyness of technology and people and noise. You can quietly sit on a shoreline and hear loons and eagles. You can watch the ducks and it's a great place to just get in tune with nature. There's a lot of opportunities to do that and you don't even have to go that far to experience it. The beauty and spirit of the Boundary Waters derives from the fact that it is elemental. There is water. There is forest. There is rock. And there is sky. I have discovered in a lifetime of traveling in primitive regions, a lifetime of seeing people living in the wilderness and using it, that there is a hard core of wilderness need in everyone, a core that makes its spiritual values a basic human necessity. Sigurd F. Olson. Everyone who visits Voyagers and the Boundary Waters discovers that spirituality. There's definitely a spiritual aspect to it. I think everybody feels it when they're up there. I mean, it, and it's like all spiritual things, I think it's highly personal, but obviously the native people, um, the Ojibwe people that we know the most about had strong spiritual connections to the Boundary Waters. And, and they left their uh, pictographs and their legends and, and they still, uh, it's not, it's not like it's an ancient thing. They're still there, still feeling that spiritual connection. It's, it's vital right to this day. And Water in our culture has always been a meaning of life to us. You know, it's always been part of everything that we do every day. So I, I feel like we are the protectors of Mother Earth too. You know, that's, that's one of the things that we've 
I've been, you know, taught is to is to protect what we have and and to respect Mother Earth, you know. And that's what I I guess one of the things that I'm here for is not to is not to disrespect her in any way, you know, through any type of uh, destruction of her, I guess. So. Uh, me personally, I really, you know, my teachings growing up, um, raised traditionally, was none of this is ours, none of it belongs to us. Um, we're just, we just happen to live here, um, you know, on Mother Earth. So and all these things that are around us, you know, trees, you know, everything is, is um, it's not ours to own at all. We don't believe in ownership of land and anything like that. So, you know, Given their background and their own spirituality, they find their own path in the wilderness. But it, it definitely brings that out in people. There's, there's something about it that that causes people to have spiritual feelings and, and to, uh, it's just the slowing down, the self-examination, the, the being outwardly oriented. That's a, that's a big thing for me is when you're in civilization, you're so oriented, you're so focused on yourself and how you're interacting with other people. And when you get in the wilderness, you, you gradually expand out so you're aware of what's going on around you and less, and less focused on yourself. And in a sense, you get to know yourself better when you do that because it just opens you up to spiritual feelings and, and uh, learning things about yourself that you wouldn't learn otherwise. The beauty of the Boundary Waters is a subtle beauty. The beauty of clouds and trees reflecting in the stillness of its lakes. The beauty of the cattails rippling in its marshes. the beauty of its bogs. And their carnivorous plants. The beauty of the glistening sedges in its fens. The beauty of the quiet and sounds of nature. and the beauty of its glorious sunsets and sunrises. The beauty of the Boundary Waters is 
think so many things for so many different people. Uh, for some people, it's, it's a pretty sunset and, and trees, and maybe they don't know much more about it than that, but it's just being outside in nature. I think as people return to the area, they, they grow more fond of the granite outcroppings. I think it's those, those granite rock cliffs and sheer walls that really define the area and give it its distinctive character, this, this rugged terrain sculpted by the most recent glacier that retreated 10,000 years ago. It's a rugged, beautiful wilderness and, and surprisingly fragile. You see um, just how little soil and resources there are to support these giant red and white pines. If they tip over, there might be a huge like, bottle cap of roots that go down maybe four inches, but spread out all around it, and so are especially susceptible to windstorms. Uh, it's a rugged beauty. Uh, for me, beauty is linked to a kind of reverence, like we're sitting here beside Lake Superior, and, and I can feel its, um, its power just as I'm near it. But there is a special kind of beauty in the Boundary Waters that occurs after the sun sets. I do like to get out in my canoe here at Voyagers National Park on a quiet day. Even today, it's a nice chance to get out and paddle, particularly in the evenings when the stars are starting to come out because out here, we're unaffected by the light pollution, so it's a great chance to be able to see the stars, the Milky Way, northern lights, meteor showers. These are opportunities that you don't get within the cities because of that light pollution. But out here, we are unaffected by it because we are so far away from the cities. And even the biggest city isn't really that big, so we're unaffected by those. It's a great place to be able to escape. I love to paddle out on a calm lake at night and just watch the stars and feel the glide of the canoe. As Sig Olson writes about in the singing wilderness, you, you lose a sense of that boundary. I love the name of the Boundary Waters because the boundaries disappear. And you, you dip your paddle down into the water and it's though you're stirring the stars. The geology of the Boundary Waters and Voyagers National Park in particular is first and foremost about the core of the North American continent. The first surface area to emerge out of Earth's primeval seas. It is a geology that may go back as far as the beginning of the planet, when what is known as the Canadian Shield was built. It is a vast area that formed at the time of the Laurentian mountain building event the nucleus of the North American continent. When the crust-forming geology of this era subsided, the mineral-rich heart of the continent was in place. Everything else is an add-on to what we now know as North America. In 1971, Richard Nixon signed the bill in January, and one of the major portions of the bill says establishment of the park was for establishing an area where you have outstanding geologic features and outstanding geologic scenery, which basically uh, tell us about the core of the continent, in other words, the evolution of the North American continent. And so when we talk about the park here, we have to tell that story. The story is in the rocks. Indeed, each step in the early creation of the continent is geologically present in the park. Lee Grimm has been a park interpretive ranger, a geologist, a biologist, and now works on Boundary Waters Preservation Projects. He knows the geology of the area better than most. A geology that is now represented in a park geologic surface map. This is a really good visualization because what you see up here is an early period of time where volcanism occurred. We call this a greenstone belt. And greenstone belts are usually, I don't know, hundreds of miles long maybe, 10, 
15, 20 miles wide. They, they formed as a result of volcanic activity. Um, and there's evidence up here. When we go up here and look in this area, we can see evidence of the volcanism. We can see evidence of the erosion of the volcanic materials in there and so on. Lee took us on a boat trip to see some of these very early rocks in the Greenstone Belt. We're in the middle of Jackfish Bay West End on a small island. And uh, we have some examples here of two geologic things, at least. First of all, uh, we're standing on some schist, which is a metamorphic rock. It used to be sediments, maybe even volcanic ash and things like that. And if you'll notice uh, down here in the bottom on this bedrock, you'll see all kinds of small little pebbles. And they all seem to be running in the same direction, don't they? And they're running kind of to the northeast and to the southwest. And then if you look carefully here, you can see remnants of the ancient bedding plains. See here's pink, here's dark, and so on. And they all seem to be running in the same direction, don't they? And embedded within those beds of silt or sand or whatever the case may be, are these small pebbles. What people think happened to cause this is there was volcanism going on and earthquake activity going on here at the beginning of the continent's formation. Well, eventually what happened is that they uh, got buried so deep and, and subsequent plate tectonic activity came along and metamorphosed, metamorphosed those horizontal layers and sediments and squeezed the little rocks all in the same direction as well as the original bedding planes. And in this particular case, the planes are not horizontal like a stack of papers, but they're tilted, aren't they? So this is uh, one of the kinds of activities that indicates ancient uh, earthquake activity, volcanism perhaps, in the early formation of the Greenstone Belt in the area. The large blue area on the map represents volcanic erosional sediments that settled to the bottom of the ocean around the Greenstone Belts. Sediments that were eventually metamorphized by intense heat and pressure into schist in quartzite. Rocks that at some point were folded and tilted. These tilted rocks are some of the most common in the park today. Well, after this all goes on, you can see the blue here. You notice in the bottom of the map here, we got all these pinks and purples and, and things like that. There are a few of those up here in, in these areas. And what these are is they represent intrusions of granitic magma, not stuff coming out of volcanoes, but necessarily, but granitic magma that intruded into these rocks that were there. And so you see that these got oriented in this particular direction here. But this, this area down to the south here of the park, and it's part of what geologists call a batholith. And a batholith is a huge area of granitic magma that intruded in over time into the, into the crust. And what happens then is that it never gets to the surface. It only intrudes in part way and cools. Like if we had a block of ice cream, vanilla, and we took a little tube with some hot chocolate and squirted into it, and it got in there and eventually it cooled down, but it never gets to the surface. Well, then you gotta scrape away all the ice cream, right, until you get down to what? The chocolate, which is a granitic magma. And so that's what we have in the southern part of the park. The highest areas in the park are down in the south. One of the highest areas in the park is down by the Ash River Visitor Center. So all of these rocks here in the park represent a tremendous period of ancient volcanism and mountain building. Mountains that at one time might have rivaled the Rockies of today. A mountain building process that began 2.5 billion years ago 
and ended approximately 570 million years ago. But after millions of years, erosion has left a relatively flat core of the continent. However, it was a more recent event that put the final touches on the boundary waters geology. Glaciation. Approximately 190,000 years ago, the Pleistocene Ice Age epoch began. Multiple times, glaciers extended into present-day Voyagers National Park in the Boundary Waters. The glaciers scooped out the Lake Superior Basin and smoothed many of the granites and rocks of the region. They left behind unconsolidated rocks, sediments, and thin soils resting on top of the oldest North American rocks. The result is a relatively flat area of large basins occupied by a myriad of lakes, smaller ponds, and the area's many wetlands all interconnected by a visually stunning network of waterways, and all making for a unique collection of northern ecosystems. Boundary Waters is home to the southern edge of the majestic Boreal Forest. The Boreal Forest is the world's largest land-based biome. Spreading over three continents, it plays a significant role in the planet's biodiversity. Like the Amazon, the boreal forest is of critical importance to all living things. Its trees and peatlands comprise one of the world's largest carbon reservoirs. Its wetlands filter millions of gallons of water each day. And as a vast and intact forest ecosystem, it still supports a natural food web, complete with large carnivores like bears and wolves. The boundary waters sandwiched between the boreal forest to the north and the eastern deciduous forest to the south is a quilt work of forest types. stands a forest with a particular composition of tree species. For example, here are many stands of aspen birch forest. The paper birch is perhaps the most picturesque tree in the region. The brilliant white bark peels into fine horizontal strips and it's punctuated with small black marks and scars. This is the tree from which the voyagers and Native Americans crafted their sturdy birch bark canoes. The aspen with its smoother bark is distinguished by quaking leaves vibrating in the region's ever-present breezes. It is common to find mixed into this forest oaks that are part of the eastern deciduous forest. Throughout the parks, there are stands of black spruce, white spruce, and Douglas fir forests. Then there is the rocky outcrop woodlands found on many of the region's numerous islands. Here we find the hardy jack pine, a true pioneer species. Here we are in the Golden Gate on the far east end of Dryweed Island, north part of Voyager's Park in the Greenstone Belt, and we're looking at a jack pine uh, species. And um, a lot of the trees in the boreal forest are fire dependent. 
and this is one of them. And the cones that they produce are called serotonous cones. And they remain closed until the heat comes, like in a forest fire, and opens them up, and then they drop their seeds. And then the seeds germinate. So uh, we have lots of places in the park uh, where there have been fires in the past, the fires of the 20s and the 30s. And when you go to these spots, what you find is some pretty good sized stands of jack pine. But the signature boreal forest type in the boundary waters is the spectacular northern pine forest with its stately white and red pines. At one time, the old growth stands of white pine dominated the region. But these fell to the lumberman's axe and saw. The eastern white pine has the distinction of being the tallest tree east of the Rockies. In old growth pre-colonial stands, white pine have been known to grow over 230 feet in height and reach five feet in diameter. The needles are in bundles of five with a deciduous sheath. They are flexible, bluish green, finely serrated, giving the trees their characteristic wispy appearance. Old growth stands of the smaller red pine are half the size of the white pine, but still easily reach heights over 70 feet tall. Its shorter dark green needles are bundled in pairs. The bark of the tree often takes on a red tinge. And because its trunks are so characteristically straight, they were widely used as telephone poles. The Boundary Waters also contains a wonderful variety of wetland ecosystems. One of these is the freshwater marsh, characterized by the presence of cattails. Cattails have a unique flowering spike and flat blade-like leaves that reach heights from three to 10 feet. They're one of the most common plants in large marshes and on the edges of ponds, edges which often contain wild rice. And of course, the iconic lily pads with their picturesque lotus flowers. Fens are another type of wetland found in the region. Unlike their cousins, the acidic bogs, fens are chemically alkaline or neutral. They are treeless wetlands dominated by sedges. When people come to the park here, they're usually on the water and up on the rock ridges, but one of the hidden places in the park are the bogs. And these bogs are overlaying what used to be Lake Agassiz, which is a glacial lake. And so as the lake drained over time, these uh, unique groups of plants, assemblages, came together in these areas. Bogs occur where water at the ground surface is acidic and low in nutrients. Because there are many highly specialized animals and plants associated with bogs, it is a habitat that contains significantly important biodiversity. Most bog plants are uniquely capable of tolerating the combination of low nutrient levels and high water tables. Bogs are the source of many important domesticated fruits, blueberries, and cranberries. Along with the ericaceous shrubs, shrubs that are often evergreen, the dominant plant in a bog is sphagnum moss. Walking on a mat of sphagnum moss has a unique springy quality. There are over 300 species of sphagnum moss each with an enormous capacity to hold water. 
And when they die, they produce peat, an agriculturally important product. But there are some special types of plants only found in bogs. One of the kinds of plants that grew up in here are carnivorous plants, man-eating plants. <laughs> Only they're not man size here. So what we have down here are pitcher plants. And what you can see here is this long stem, looks like almost 18 to 20 inches, with the flower on the top. And uh, that flower is, uh, is unique in its characteristics. But the main thing that's interesting here, and the flower no doubt probably attracts insects and things, but the main thing of interest down here, these leaves that form a rounded piece that holds water. And the water stays in there. And inside the leaf, the round leaf, are downward pointing hair-like structures. And when insects get attracted to what's in here, they fall into the pitchers and they get in there and they try to get out and it's hard for them to get out because of these downward pointing hair-like structures. And so what happens is that the insects die in these pitchers. And what happens in that water eventually? What's, what happens when you're dead? You decompose, right? And after you decompose, these leaves have a unique ability, like our stomachs and our intestines, to absorb and transfer the nutrients into their tissues to give them sustenance that they need. There is another carnivorous plant in the bog, which has a different strategy for obtaining nutrients from animal material. It is the tiny sundew. Sundews comprise one of the largest genera of carnivorous plants, containing nearly 200 species. Each plant has a number of sticky glandular hairs that secrete sweet mucilage to attract and ensnare insects. In addition, sundews are able to move their tentacles in response to contact with digestible prey. Another kind of wetland is the tamarack bog or swamp forest. The tamarack, also known as the American larch, is a small to medium-sized deciduous coniferous tree. Interestingly, the tamarack is not an evergreen. Its short, light blue-green needles turn bright yellow before they fall in autumn, providing a splash of vivid color in the boundary waters. Then there are the amazing pristine lakes. The waters within Voyages National Park range in depth. Uh, the deepest spot on Rainy Lake is about 168 feet. Right here in the bay, it can be as much as 10 feet, eight feet. There's a lot of hidden reefs and rocks. And a big reason for that is the waters are very dark. They're um, stained because of the tannins that are from the bog areas in our ecosystems. So there's this natural, staining to the water. It's very dark and hard to navigate, so you can't see the rocks until you're actually on top of them. And as far as a visual impact, we don't mark them all because there would be rock markers everywhere and it would be looking down a highway street and seeing all of the street signs along the way. The composition of the fish in the big four waters is primarily walleye, crappies, bass, northern, and sturgeon. A recent returnee to the Boundary Waters is the wolf. Rarely seen, their numbers have grown to the point where a hunting season is contemplated in Minnesota. But it is another animal that captures the haunting spirit of the Boundary Waters. If you ask people who love the Boundary Waters, what single animal defines that area? Again, I think you would receive many answers. The loon, of course, comes to mind first. And if you've ever heard the wail of the loon, um, it's a haunting sound that just gets inside your head and, and, and you never forget it. It, it, it. To me, it makes me feel uneasy in a way. Uh, 
It's such pure, raw beauty. It's almost otherworldly. White-tailed deer abound in the boundary waters. But it is their larger relative that is one of the region's two keystone species. One of two keystone species which indicate the overall health of the boundary waters ecosystem. The moose. Moose typically inhabit boreal and mixed deciduous forests of the northern hemisphere in temperate to subarctic climates. Their diet consists of both terrestrial and aquatic vegetation. Unlike most other deer species, moose are solitary animals and do not form herds. Although generally slow-moving and sedentary, moose can become aggressive and move surprisingly fast if angered or startled. They mate in the fall, giving birth to one or two calves in the springtime when lush aquatic vegetation is abundant. Like other members of the deer family, bull moose lose their antlers in late fall and regrow a new impressive rack in time for the fall mating season. The problem with the moose is a declining population. And I'm hoping we don't lose our moose population in Minnesota. It may be that we will with the changing climate. Moose are adapted to cold weather. They, they're so well insulated with their, their hollow hair that um, they begin panting at 65 degrees. And the more time they spend just keeping themselves cool, the less time they're spending fattening up in the fall. And then to go into winter somewhat undernourished and then be assaulted by these burgeoning populations of the winter tick. There might be 10,000 of these ticks on a moose and they itch. And so the moose are scraping their hides to sort of relieve themselves from that and thus losing their insulation and energy and starting the next spring in a weakened state. So it's possible we might lose moose with a changing climate. The other keystone species is much smaller. It is the species that built this lodge. An engineering marvel along the lake shore. We have a very successful beaver population, which is a huge impact as far as the ecosystems. Beavers, people, and elephants are the only ones that alter landscape. And so we really monitor what they do and how they are doing. Uh, we do have beaver surveys that keep track of the beaver population. Lee Grimm took us to his secret beaver pond hidden deep in the forest. As you can see, if you look around here, all, and they're flooding, the sti they're still flooding. The spruce and balsam are dying along the edge. But one thing you do not see is one stick of aspen, right? <laughs> so if they're gonna get aspen, guess what? If you look at the treetops over there, what do you see? Aspen, right? Aspen, aspen, aspen. So the beaver, if they're gonna get food, they're gonna have to go a long way to get to their food source to bring down. But yet, you look at that huge lodge down there. I mean, that's a big, big lodge. I bet you the base of that's 25 feet, 20 feet. The water is coming from the northwest. There's uh, four or five other beaver ponds up there. It comes into here and then it goes down the creek here and into Sullivan Bay on Cab, on Cab Togama Lake. So this is what the beaver do in an area that's low is they come in, they establish a pond, then they keep moving upstream, 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 until they get a flowage. So they have a nice source of water coming and they, you know, got plenty of area to draw their food from. But sooner or later, what happens is that the uh, sedges, the cattails, and lots of other things begin to fill this in. And so what you see is the evolution of a, of a meadow in here and eventually the beaver are going to abandon this place and maybe the trees will start growing back in. You can already see some trees that are starting to move in out here, but they're not aspen. But So here's the second lodge. Here's the dam right here. 
<clears throat> you can see some of the old dam over there. You see where the cattails are going across? They didn't fool with that. They started right here on this bedrock as a good anchor. You can see where they've been coming and going here. And they are still putting some mud around here, but it goes all the way over there. And uh, when we're done here, we'll walk that way and we'll see another dam. That's a couple other dams that are sitting down there. Of course, beaver, more than any other animal, played a major role in the history of the Boundary Waters. Following the retreat of the last glacier 10,000 years ago, Neolithic big game hunters spread into the Boundary Waters area, following herds of mammoths and other megafauna. They were followed by an Eastern archaic culture that hunted smaller game and deer. Eventually, they gave way to a woodland culture that crafted pottery and built burial mounds. These were the ancestors of the present-day Ojibwe, the largest tribe of the Algonquin-speaking people in eastern Canada and northeastern United States. Today, they still celebrate their heritage at powwows across the region. In the 18th century, the voyagers descended on the Boundary Waters, These hardy trappers searched for furs, mainly beaver pelts, and transported them by canoe across the region's many lakes, eventually arriving in Montreal. From there, they were sent to markets on the East Coast in Europe. One critical factor in this whole industry was the famous, and even infamous, rendezvous on the eastern edge of the Boundary Waters at Grand Portage. Here furs from the interior were exchanged for goods and money. By 1892, the era of the voyagers ended. A logging boom hit the area at the turn of the 20th century. Huge quantities of timber were cut down and used for construction. Other logs were sent to paper mills. Ironically, it was at the same time that another segment of the population began movements to preserve and establish parks in the area. One of those was Ernest Oberholzer, who declared, when you destroy the beauty of the region, you destroy its utility. In Lake Superior's northwest corner sits Isle Royal National Park, a unique and remote wilderness archipelago, a roadless land of wild creatures, unspoiled forests, refreshing lakes, and rugged scenic shores, a wilderness accessible only by boat or float plane, Visitors can travel the over 132,000 acres of land by foot only along the 165 miles of island trails. Isle Royal was authorized by Congress in 1931 during President Herbert Hoover's administration to conserve a prime example of Northwood's wilderness. Nine years later, it was established as a national park by Franklin Roosevelt. Isle Royale, which is actually part of uh, uh, Michigan, um, is closer to Canada and Minnesota. And it's a wonderful, wild island. Uh, there's a lake in the middle of Isle Royale with an island on it. And the sailors are fond of saying that island 
is the largest island on the largest lake on the largest island on the largest lake in the world. Indeed, Lake Superior is the largest freshwater lake in the world. The lake visitors must travel on to reach Isle Royal. Travel by either jumping on board a ferry from Copper Harbor or Houghton, Michigan, or in our case, Grand Portage, Minnesota. Bright and early, travelers to Isle Royal board the Sea Hunter 3. Some will kayak and camp along the island shores. Others are in for a spectacular day trip. Today the waters are choppy, and although everyone is soaked, they remain in good spirits. A harbinger that the island is nearing is the colorfully named Rock of Ages Reef, a deadly outcropping of rocks west of Isle Royal. The reef is home to Rock of Ages Lighthouse, first lit up in 1910, then automated in 1978. Upon reaching Wendigo Harbor, visitors are greeted by park ranger Katie Keller, who will lead an interpretive walk along one of the park's many rocky trails. Isle Royal is one of those green stone belts formed during the volcanic period billions of years ago, when the North American continent rose above the primordial oceans. However, the presence of glacial erratics point to a time when the island was once covered by ice. Today's hike leads up and down along streams and through forests of black and white spruce and balsam fir. Through forests of aspen and birch, there is the more common paper birch and the rarer yellow birch. In wetter areas loom the large northern white cedar. The open nature of many areas along the trail allows for understory plants to flourish, including many edible berries such as bunchberry, raspberry, and blueberries, as well as others not so edible. There are also stunning stands of bracken ferns, and many equicetum primitive plants, hearkening back to the age of dinosaurs. Primitive plants that reproduce by spores. This whole system of plants and animals is basically a closed ecological system. An ecological system famous for the predator-prey relationship between its wolf and moose populations. It's the closest thing that you can get to a natural controlled environment. Because in theory, everything that's here can't leave. It's stuck. And this study, Moose Wolf, has been going on for 54 years now, and it's the longest study of its kind ever conducted. Mm. And as of last year's count, we have nine wolves and 750 moose here. And speaking of moose, I want you all to imagine for a moment that you are one. You walk on four legs, and you weigh anywhere from 1,000 to 1,800 pounds and you're covered with a big, thick coat of brown hair. One of the more curious features on the island is its natural bonsai gardens. These are balsam fir trees that the moose have eaten down to the snow cover during winter. Pruned back each year like a Japanese garden, many of these trees are over 40 years old. If you venture to Isle Royal, you would almost certainly encounter Isle Royal's ubiquitous red squirrel. Isolated from their relatives for so long, these squirrels are now considered a distinct subspecies. Since they are here on this island, they don't need to be as big as they are back on the mainland. So over time, 
they have made themselves smaller as an adaptation because they don't need to be so big. One last feature along the trail, a fenced-in area that demonstrates what the land would look like without the browsing of moose. At last, the trail leads back along the shoreline, once more overlooking the magnificent waters of Lake Superior. Established in 1958, Grand Portage National Monument lies entirely within the boundaries of the Grand Portage Ojibwe Indian Reservation. The reconstructed British Northwest Company Depot celebrates the Boundary Waters Fur Trade Days and the Ojibwe Way of Life. In its time, the depot was the most profitable fur trade operation on the Great Lakes. What one of the partners said was, are we rich or are we stinking rich? The Northwest Company operated in this area from uh, about 1780s to 1802 when uh, we moved lock, stock, and barrel up to what's now Thunder Bay. Sixteen wooden buildings stood within the palisade. Outside the walls were gardens, a warehouse, and permanent workers' camps. We see between 600 and 800 of them. Um, they're of the lowest class in society, but within that class, they're as, almost as high as you can get. Um, myself, dressed as a guide or an interpreter, my salary would be between 350 and 450 French livres, uh, which is a currency no longer in existence, but um, our equivalency in dollars today, we're talking between five and 6,000 bucks. Um, that said, back in the day, in our equivalency, a loaf of bread would cost five cents, so they're doing pretty good. They're doing well enough to start buying the extreme hats and fitting the plumes and they have more cooking gear and they have their own tents. Uh, we see a lot more blankets and some finery as far as uh, a couple pieces of china which is um, sort of unheard of for their class so they're doing pretty well here. Our Northwest worker is just one of hundreds of people who come here every summer to bring those colorful days of the fur trading rendezvous back to life. Now enjoy the sights and sounds of the days of old. At the same time as the rendezvous, the Ojibwe people put on a powerful powwow, confirming their heritage. The, the celebration brings us all together. You know, this is why I came up here, is, is, you know, to get out of my area and come up and, and hang out with other Anishinaabe people and also the, the non-natives, uh, non I guess, my friends too. So, just a good time to get out and dance and pray and, and uh, you know, healing too. So, yeah, the drum is um is the it's called the heartbeat of our nation, and there's um some different teachings that go along with carrying a drum and, and singing on the drum, and um it's all part of uh, the circle of life, we'll say. All in all, it is a time of great celebration. Eventually, the fur trading days disappeared, and a new breed of people looked to recapture the solitude and beauty of the boundary waters. Well, the Boundary Waters is a true wilderness, and uh, that's why I always refer to it as the, by the somewhat cumbersome title of Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Uh, and I always make sure to add that wilderness because that's what it is. And it's a formal wilderness so designated by Congress as a wilderness. And there's some, there's some paradoxes in that because uh, 
you know, the birds and the animals don't know what's wilderness and what isn't. But Congress has drawn a line around this particular piece of land and, and said this is a wilderness. Indeed, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness is a massive 1,090,000 acre wilderness area. The area presents a unique experience for the visitor. Renowned as a destination for both canoeing and fishing, it is the most visited wilderness in the United States. Allowing only motorized boats in a few of the larger lakes, the Canoe Area Wilderness has over 1,000 lakes, numerous portage trails, and nearly 2,200 backcountry campsites. It is one of Minnesota's top tourist attractions, drawing visitors from all over the United States and the world. Achieving wilderness status was not easy. The whole establishment of the uh, Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness did not come easily. Um, we so often just assume that everyone agreed that it should be set aside. But back in the 1930s, Ely, Minnesota was one of the largest areas for float plane traffic and uh, canoe outfitters would leave equipment, all set up, tents all set up in a very remote lake, and the uh, paying guests would be flown in, landed uh, 50 yards from the campsite, and, and have their wilderness experience that way. That was one model. Uh, at that time, the Ely Chamber of Commerce uh, had a motto, which was a road to every lake. So in contrast to this vision of beautifully developed areas, which I think we all appreciate. There was another notion that certain parts of nature should be left undeveloped so that we really could use our imaginations on what this continent was once like. And many people saw that as a threat to their livelihoods. It's hard to make a living up here. Sig Olson had to face down angry neighbors. Uh, he and Bud Heinzelman had their effigies burned uh, that were in protest of their stand to preserve wilderness. So, so many people fought so many years to set it aside. And the thing about development versus preservation, and I'm not the first to say this, but um, that the developers only have to win one time. And my friends in the DNR are fond of saying the last crop is asphalt. So thanks to men like Sigurd Olsen and Ernest Oberholzer, the developers didn't win. And with the Wilderness Act of 1964, which Olson helped craft, there is a place now where people can experience the country as it once was. Where there is just you, your kayak or canoe, in intimate relationship with the wilderness, with the rocks, forest, air and water. Established in 1975, Voyager National Park is basically a water park. The park encompasses all or part of four major lakes. Rainy Lake, Captogama Lake, Namakan Lake, Sandpoint Lake, and of course many small lakes. The Captogama Peninsula, which lies entirely within the park, makes up most of its land area and is accessible only by boat. In fact, the best way to experience the park is by boat, canoe, or kayak. But for the less adventuresome, guided boat tours depart each day during the summer from the park's three visitor centers. However, the most spectacular way to see the park is by air we were invited to travel with the park's chief ranger and pilot, Jim Hummel, as he made his daily rounds. We departed in the park's seaplane near the Rainy Lake Visitor Center. Immediately, the majesty of voyagers is understood as the park expands in front of us. 
The first sight to see is what's called the chain of lakes, a narrow valley of interconnected lakes right in the middle of the Captogama Peninsula. Next, we get a stunning look at Captogama Lake, a large freshwater lake that is almost entirely surrounded by the park. Now we arrive at the southeast boundary of the park, a remote area that contains one of the park's most amazing sights, the Grassy Bay Cliffs. A set of sheer granite cliffs covered in lush vegetation. The next site is Kettle Falls Historic District. Located in the northeast corner of the park, it contains two large dams, which were constructed at the turn of the 20th century to provide additional water for Rainy Lake's many paper mills. But the highlight of Kettle Falls is the Kettle Falls Hotel, seen here with the bright red roof. Built in 1910, the hotel is still active today, and amazingly, the only lodging available in Voyager's National Park. Just around the bend, and located along the shores of Rainy Lake, we approach the beautiful Anderson Bay, here, Jim takes us down for the first and only water landing of the trip. As we land, we can see a massive outcropping of granite cliffs. Cliffs that can also be viewed from a nearby dock. From here, the adventurers can hike the famous cruiser trail and camp in the deep and remote interior of the park. We're back in the air and heading toward our last stop, the magnificent Soldier Point. Located in the north part of the park, this long and narrow point was carved by glaciers during the last ice age. As we end our trip, an expanse of lakeside houses looms on the horizon, a sign that we are leaving Voyagers. It has been a trip to remember, a trip to one of the most untouched and stunning places in the U.S. Outdoorsman and writer Stephen Wilbers sums up the spirit and importance of the Boundary Waters. What is the most important thing about the Boundary Waters? It's like asking, what is the most important thing about life? And with all the things going on and complexities, technology and our modern pace of things, I think we sometimes forget the elementals. Some people find that through religion. Other people find it through literature and poetry and art and dance. Uh, other people find it through nature. And for me, all those things come together in the Boundary Waters. It's, it's, it's all one of the, and the same thing. The beauty of nature to me is spiritual. It is being as close to God as I can get, is to be in the Boundary Waters. So to be in a wilderness area that's been preserved and a state as close as we can get it to in its, its, its natural state is a, uh, a religious experience that gets me back to the essentials of life. I do some of my best thinking there. I think most clearly there. I feel most alive and I feel closest to this, this higher power that I know is there that we all try to sort of define and figure out in our own way. But that's my church, uh, the Boundary Wires.